Thanks. Um, welcome everyone to the latest in our uh, School of Humanities lecture series. I'm delighted to introduce um, Neil MacDonald, who is the uh, Lord Kelvin Amherst Fellow, Research Fellow in Philosophy. And Neil, in, in, in a paper he's written with Nathan Wild and an ex-colleague of ours who's now in Utrecht, I think. Um, Tilburg. Yeah, Tilburg. I'm sorry. Um, it's a really about puzzle. It's in case he watches it. Puzzle, puzzle, puzzle. <laughs> yes, it will, be, it will be on the School of Humanities website. So Neil, um, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so uh, this paper is actually the second uh, in a pair of papers that Nathan and I have written. Um, we're writing here on the metaphysics of, uh, of virtual reality in the first instance, but we are detecting a potential problem, not one that's been articulated against us yet, but a potential problem that might arise for the view that we've taken. So uh, the question that we are motivated by, I guess, is in what sense is virtual reality reality? Um, you could ask, are virtual entities genuinely real? And are virtual entities and their experiences as we associate with them, are they genuinely valuable? Now, for Nathan and I, the answer is no, they're not real, but yes, they're still valuable. And ultimately, that gives us a bit of a puzzle as to say how they can be valuable if they're not real. So I'm going to sketch First of all, the first paper, effectively, which is like um, uh, a bit of an overview of what David Chalmers has said, which got us responding to him with some, some counter. And we wanted to say, no, we think he's wrong. Uh, he says that virtual entities are genuinely real. We say they're not. Um, and then he also says that they're genuinely valuable and ties this to the fact that they're genuinely real. But we can't do that same thing if we're not saying they're genuinely real. So we think he could and hasn't yet. Um, our realists in general could raise this puzzle for us. So the roadmap here to talk about this is I'll start off by um, sketching virtual realism and irrealism, these two different views. We are irrealists for the avoidance of doubt. And we'll run through quickly kind of what Chalmers says and what we said against them. And then in the second bit, I want to tell you about our positive story, the good news story about how we think we should think about virtual entities, not just that the realist is wrong, but there's something more useful we can say. Then I'll introduce what I think is the, the core part of what I want to talk about today, which is this really cool court case that went through the Dutch, um, Dutch legal system. It reached their Supreme Court, which I later found out was not in fact their highest court. Their highest court is the High Court. <laughs> but anyway, that's just fun. Um, so they think about this case uh, where there's a virtual entities at stake and they raise what we consider to be the puzzle of virtual theft, which inspires the puzzle of virtual value. Now, the puzzle of virtual value, we think, uh, is the core of an objection that somebody like Chalmers, some realist, could come and accuse uh, Nathan and I of having given a faulty picture of the virtual because of. And we are going to defend against that here and talk a little bit again about why this Waltonian fictionalism picture that we proposed in the first place works really well in this court case too. So we think it's got this nice feature about it. Okay, so I'll start with the, the realism and irrealism. Now, this is really useful. It's often very difficult to kind of talk to people about VR, but now what we've got is a GIF that does it for me. So down here in the corner, what you've got is uh, what you would see in the real world. It just looks like a person miming away to themselves with some funny wires and, and, and controllers and such like. What that person sees and basically experiences is this kind of world where they are, sh cartoony world, where they're shooting these cartoon Vikings that are coming to raid their castle. They pull back, the bow fires, the bow hits the, the Vikings, the Vikings explode, red balloons, not blood, comes out, and so on. So what you get is this thing, it happens in the real world, it's this kind of weird miming action. And what happens in the virtual world is all this much more involved stuff, and the person in the situation might experience it as though that is really happening, and we on the outside will point and laugh a little bit as they do so. So this is kind of VR, and the question is, those Vikings, that bow and arrow, that interaction between them, is that genuinely real? Well, for me, the answer is no, right? I didn't think it was terribly odd to say that. And yet, here we have David Chalmers arguing exactly the opposite. Now, the reason I'll start with Chalmers is because he did, in fact, write about this, which was handy. He's also very prominent in philosophy, so he's a well-known figure to throw mud at. Um, so he says, he argues in this paper for several key theses, um, and what I'll say today is very negative about the paper, but read it, it's actually quite good. Um, and the arguments are, aren't as daft as I'll try and make them sound. But the virtual objects really exist as his first and foremost claim, and he's very clear that they are not secondary 
there's not second class citizens in the world, right? Virtual entities are genuinely real. He then says that they are genuinely valuable and that the events that take place in VR genuinely take place. He's really emphasizing this all the way down the line. And he says this thing at the end, which is really important. Virtual experiences can be just as valuable as non-virtual experiences. Now, what he doesn't say is virtual entities are real, therefore they're valuable. But when he's talking about why we should think that they're valuable, it does allude to the fact that they, he's already established, so he says that they're real. They're connected, these two issues, right? And I don't want to get bogged down in how Chalmers does it, but there is an intuitive connection between the fact that something being real and something being valuable might go hand in hand, such that we've even got a question uh, to answer later on. So that's where Chalmers starts off. And he gives this argument, he gives several actually, but he gives this argument that we like to pick up on because it, it particularly lets me use some of the stuff I think about uh, in general about causation in, into the picture. So Chalmers argues that virtual objects have certain causal powers, right? They're able to affect other virtual objects, affect users and so on. So the bow and arrow are able to kind of interact in such a way that the arrow flies and then the arrow hits the Viking in such a way that the Viking explodes. And then once the Vikings raid and get your castle, you throw off the headset and have a tantrum in the real world, right? So there's connections between the real world stuff, the virtual stuff, and then the real world stuff again. And what Charmer says is, look, we have, a causal, we have causal powers at play here. We have thing, causal things happening. He then says that digital objects, and I'll see what he means by that in a second, digital objects really have those causal powers, and importantly, nothing else does. So digital objects, what he's got in mind here, are, should be kind of non-controversial things. He's talking about the kind of silicon chips that operate inside these devices that are giving rise to the virtual objects. He's talking about the bits and bytes on the chip, something you could kind of snapshot in physics, that thing. So he thinks digital objects really have the causal powers and nothing else does, so virtual objects are digital objects. Now, what's really important, if you do metaphysics, is that R. It's kind of weird. Throughout his paper, it's not clear whether or not Chalmers is saying that they are in the sense of what we like to think of as identity or are in some weaker type of relation. So it's important, this distinction, because identity can only hold between one thing and itself. It can't hold between one thing and two things, right? No two things can be literally identical. They can be kind of so alike each other that we would use ordinary language and say, ah, they're identical. But what we mean there is that they are qualitatively identical. They have the same kind of characteristics, two identical dresses, that sort of thing. But here, and certainly in metaphysics, when we think about identity, we mean numerical identity, like literally the same thing as. And here, we could read that here, and I'll say why I think that's odd, or you could read it as the slightly weaker thing. Now, throughout the paper, it looks to us like Chalmers kind of changes his tune. We've had some correspondence with him that didn't exactly clear this up, right? But I'll stick to the version we were dealing with before. So this two ways of reading what's going on in Chalmers gives us these two different versions of his virtual digitalism, right? this var variant on realism. The first one is that virtual objects and data structures, that is the bits and bytes, this digital object he's talking about, the silicon chip stuff. Virtual objects and that are identical in the sense that I was just talking about. That's the strong view. The weak view says that virtual objects depend on the data structures, but they're not identical with them. Now, in the spirit of public lecture, I was trying to think of some non-philosophical examples of where we get the kind of identity versus this, uh, what we call maybe supervenience or some other type of relation here. I just couldn't think of any. So I'll give you the one, the best known one in philosophy, which may maybe be uh, helpful anyway, which is this pattern we normally spot in the likes of the philosophy of mind. When you think, think about the relationship between the mind and the brain, you might think the mind just is the brain, identical, right? That would be this kind of strong reductionist picture. Or you might think that there's this kind of weaker picture, usually called non-reductive physicalism, where the mind depends upon the brain, but it's more complicated than identity, right? So that's the kind of background against which we're seeing some of this virtual reality stuff, just to put it in a bit of context for you. And quite like the philosophy of mind case, actually, in both cases, causal powers start to become central to what people talk about. So Chalmers, remember, his argument was they've got causal powers. They're the only things that have got the causal powers, so uh, they, they must relate in this important way, to be clarified. So we think that there's a problem with both of these. This is just Chalmers' positive case for being a realist, and we think you shouldn't be a realist. So first of all, our argument against strong virtual digitalism. We raise this counterexample called the cross-play problem. So suppose... 
Nathan and I are uh, playing a, a game of virtual frisbee, uh, and he's on his PlayStation and I'm on an Xbox, or he's on the Oculus Rift and I'm on the HTC Vive. Ultimately, we're on very different systems, not just different instances of the same system. To keep it clear, these are really different. The architecture's different, the silicon chip's different, totally different. So we're playing against each other, and to avoid something that Charmer slips in at one point, we'll say there's no server in between. There's no third machine that controls what's going on in the game. We are just playing, as I say, P2P, peer-to-peer. -peer. We're playing one computer to the other directly. So in that scenario, there's a one virtual frisbee that we're throwing between each other. The game wouldn't make much sense if there was more than one. We've got this one frisbee, we're throwing it between each other, and we can ask what digital object is identical with that frisbee? Because we've got two candidates, right? We've got the one in my computer, and we've got the one in Nathan's computer. But identity doesn't hold between one virtual frisbee and two things in the world. It needs to hold one to one. That's identity. That's the nature of the beast. So if it's identical with a digital object, if that's the strength of that R that I highlighted before, then um, Chalmers needs to tell us which one it is. And he's got two bad options, right? One, he's got to say, oh, it's Neil's one rather than Nathan's. But it's just unprincipled. He's just plumping. He's just picking one out of the air. The other option is he can say it's identical with both, but then, then that's just not identity. So cases like this, the cross-play problem, we think should tell you that you shouldn't literally identify the virtual entity with some digital object. So that's the strong version taken care of from our point of view. I'm very much going quickly over this, of course. If you want the detail, read the paper. <laughs> but this is the uh, weak virtual digitalist counter-argument. So remember how important the causal powers bit is for Chalmers. He needs there to be causal powers at play between the virtual bow and arrow and the virtual viking and all those things internal to the virtual sphere. He needs real causation in there. And I want to say I don't think that's real causation at all. So think first of all about the case of traditional animation. Right? In traditional animation, if we played this quickly enough, it would look like some character had thrown a ball and hit it. Notice the causal word I'm using. Hit the ball and the ball goes, right? The character serves. But when you slow it down sufficiently and actually think about how it was made, you realize this was actually just several disparate frames. So the other way to think about it is Tom and Jerry, right? So Jerry smacks Tom on the head and then a lump appears and we would very naturally, and it would be daft not to say that the lump had been caused by Jerry smacking Tom on the head. But when you think about what really went on, there was just one frame followed by another that didn't have a causal connection between them. Had the animator decided to draw something else in that frame, something else would have appeared, right? It doesn't look like the causation really sits between the frames. It kind of sits, if it sits anywhere, between the thoughts in the head of the animator. And what we're seeing here are the kind of byproducts, if you like, in these frames. So there isn't genuine causation between the frames in traditional animation, such as there is a causal connection, it's, if you like, in the, the brain of the, the animator. VR is not traditional animation, though. It's very different. In fact, it's importantly different because it bakes in some causal rules, right? It bakes in those causal rules into what's called the game's engine. I'm going to pick on one particular one called Unity here. Unity is a game's engine that calculates the physics. So it calculates the bounce, it calculates the arrow, it calculates what should happen to the fragile Viking when the arrow strikes. That game's engine, I say, is doing roughly what the head of the animator was doing. The causal connection such as there is lives here, and it doesn't look anything like an arrow flying through the air at a Viking. What we see, okay, I've used the tennis example again, but what you see up here, right, are the frames of the animation, and there's no causal connection between them. So there isn't genuine causal connection between the arrow and the bow and the Viking. What there is is causal connection between uh, the, the bits on the silicon chip, right? But they don't look anything like what you see up there. This is a kind of standard mistake to make, if you like, uh, in attributing causation where it shouldn't be. There's some old school examples to do with light on a, you know, the, uh, shining a torch on a wall and then each sequential part of where the, the light was on the wall looks like it was caused by the last place that the light was on the wall. But that's not what's happening. It's me over here moving the torch that causes it to move. It's not the light moving uh, one bit to the next across the wall. So this is known as pseudo-causation. It's not genuine causation, it's pseudo-causation. And because Chalmers is trying to establish that virtual entities are genuinely real, pseudo won't do, right? So, I think you can read 
Chalmers is advocating either one of these and he still ends up in trouble. Either the strong version where we've got strict identity or the weaker version, which is some other relation. I didn't even say what it had to be. And then we're going to throw up this problem. Read either way, the positive argument for realism is flawed. That's what we conclude. The cross-play problem tells you that strong virtual digitalism is false, and the pseudo-causation problem undermines the case, actually for both strong and weak, but we've used it here just to talk about the weak. There's quite a lot more to be said, particularly about the weak virtual digitalism bit, but really that's what I wanted to, to point out, that our last paper got to that point in critiquing Chalmers, saying why we didn't want to be realists. Okay, so that's the bad bit. That's like, Chalmers, you're wrong. But we wanted to be able to say something positive. We wanted to be able to flip that around and say, actually, we've got a nicer story to tell in Chalmers about what really is going on with the virtual. And we wanted to propose a thing called Waltonian fictionalism. So Kendall Walton came up with this notion of how we understand representative artworks. And for representative artworks, you can read just about anything. I'm talking paintings on walls, books, movies, just about anything. And a Walt fiction is a work whose function is to serve as a prop in a game of make-believe. Right? So what Walton is saying is that all fictions are games of make-believe, and very often we've got the words on a page in a book, or the image on the screen on a, on a, on a movie, or the, uh, the oil on the canvas for a painting. We've got that, that physical object, that serves as the prop, right? the thing that you use to help you imagine, the trigger for the imagining, if you like. So according to Walton, you can have all sorts of props. You can have all sorts of weird rules that sit between the props. If you'd see children playing, they obviously, right, ima imagine this is a gun. Right, so they've just set the rule of the imagining. We've got a physical prop, and they've just told you the rules of make-believe. And Walton thinks that those rules of make-believe, principles of generation, um, uh, are really important to understand how a fiction should be read, so how a book should be read. Harry Potter should end up being read as the good guy. But there are ways in which that can go uh, go awry. They're just not licensed ways to think about it, but it doesn't make them like completely faulty. It doesn't make them. You can imagine that Voldemort's the goody, the badly maligned person, and all the rest of it. You can imagine that if you read it, you're just not doing the licensed thing. So we've got this picture of Waltonian fictionalism. We've got the props, this principle of generation, and then what we've got is the fictional entities: Harry Potter, Voldemort, whatever the scene is in the painting, and so on. The explosions, die hard, I don't know. So props do not have the features that the fictional objects they stand in for do. This does not have a trigger. It's not able to fire a gun. It's not able to fire like a gun. There's no bullet here, right? So this prop in my game of make-believe doesn't have the same features as the virtual gun, or the imagined gun, I should say. And that's true of like the wizard battle that takes place, but really the prop for it is a page with text on it. The page with text does not have the features that the wizard battle has. The 2D painting representative of a 3D space with perspectival uh, effect. It's a 2D painting. It doesn't have the same features as a 3D room. And a puppet versus a bear, right? So you've got a puppet here. It doesn't have the features of a bear, right? But we are playing a game of make-believe. And we say, imagine this is a bear. And off we go. Now, that's useful to us because we think what we can say is we can adopt a fictionalist position position with respect to the virtual. We can say virtual entities, they're not real, they're fictional, right? They're Walt fictional. The reason I put the Walt before the fictional is Walton had this super broad idea of what should count as a fiction, way more than ordinary language. It's just proven useful over the years to start talking about Walt fiction rather than fiction simpliciter. But our conclusion here, well, our conclusion from before was the realist was wrong, but our positive picture instead says, look, we don't need to think about the bow and arrow and, uh, and the Viking. We don't need to think of them as real, and we don't need to think of the causal connection between them as real. Just think of them as fictional. Just think like you think of the causal connections between um, spells cast and people killed in Harry Potter, right? You just think about that causal connection. There's no genuine causal connection between the words on the page that really is that. But there's an imagined causal connection out there. For some props, there really will be that causal connection, right? When the props are a big part of, say, a stage set or something like that, maybe you do have, like, a gun that fires. How advanced or how detailed the prop is doesn't really matter. But we think that virtual reality is an especially rich prop with an awful lot of the causal stuff taken out of the equation, a lot less imagining to do than a book or a movie or a painting. It's a special case but only by extent, it's not like a new category of thing. So virtual objects are not real, virtual objects are Walt fictional, and the data structures 
that uh, Chalmers wanted to identify them with, they are not uh, identical with Pikachu, right? They just, they're just the props by which we imagine Pikachu. They are the things by which, they are the things we use to help us in our imagining game, okay? And a lot of the imagining game is done for us when we're presented with a picture of a Pikachu on a screen, right? But it's not done and dusted yet. There's still a bit more imagining to do. Right, so Chalmers, we didn't like his picture of realism. We are irrealists. Our irrealist picture is going to be a fictional one where we say the virtual is fictional and the, way, the, the devices we use and the data structures and silicon chips and all that, that's just props. Props to, to license the imagining or to motivate the imagining. Okay. So Chalmers thinks that virtual is genuinely real and genuinely valuable. So far I've just said I don't think it's genuinely real and I've said nothing about what we think about value. But we think there might be a puzzle in the offing and this is a really interesting case that we came across that motivated us to think about it. Um, as I say, Supreme Court, not High Court. Um, here we had a case where there were two boys threatened a third and they forcefully took his virtual property from him. The details here everybody wants to know, so I'll tell you. Two boys take a knife and they hold uh, a younger, as it goes, uh, boy, but, uh, hold the knife to his throat. And under threat, he has to log in to his account in the game RuneScape and he has to drop a virtual ma uh, amulet and a virtual mask. He drops them in the game, totally within game rules to drop things. Outside of the game, he then logs off, right? And one of his assaulters, if you like, logs on goes to the same virtual spot in the virtual game with his character and picks these things up. Totally within the game rules. That's fine. You can drop things, you can pick things up. So what happened outside the game was this menaces, right? And what happened inside the game was totally fine by the rules of the game. You can't go and complain to RuneScape about what happened, exactly. So this case came to court, and of course the prosecutors have got a choice to make here. They could try and go for something like theft, which is what it looks like, and then theft plus violence equals a really serious charge of robbery. And that really does look appropriate to what I've just described to you. Um, but typically, if it's about bits and bytes moving around, then it's typically a civil matter and something to do with either copyright infringement or intellectual property theft or something like that. It's a different thing. And it certainly can't just be appended with the violence thing to become robbery at least not in the structure they were dealing with. So they were motivated to come to the conclusion that this really was theft and this really was robbery, uh, but they had to think quite hard about how to justify that. So case one goes, they're found guilty of robbery and their defense comes uh, in and appeals on the grounds that you can't be guilty of theft of virtual things because virtual things don't exist. And they don't exist, so they're not goods, and by law, only goods can be stolen, right? Cool, says we, <laughs> looking at this going, oh, we're trying to do metaphysics. That's interesting. So in the end, the appeal failed and various other iterations of it. There were loads of to and fro. It's a really interesting case to read up. But um, it was ultimately upheld by the Supreme Court. They dismissed the appeal. They concluded that virtual objects were ruled to be goods because the object of, uh, and, and can therefore be the object of, of theft and they're goods because they are potentially not they're not all valuable all of the time but just at least in this case they're valuable how can you be sure they're valuable somebody's willing to hold somebody else by <laughs> with a knife against the wall to get it right it's valuable also it's got a cash value that they could have resold on a set secondary market right it's valuable so here what they've done is they've said right it's stolen or oh, how can you steal something that doesn't exist because oh, it's valuable, right? And now how can something be valuable if it doesn't exist might be the next problem you think about. So he, here's how we think about it. The first puzzle is the puzzle of virtual theft. How can something that isn't real be stolen? And that's what they were wrestling with in this, this, this case. And then they came to the conclusion that it's okay because it's valuable, it can definitely be stolen. But from our point of view, that just moves the question. The question is now, well, how can something that isn't real be valuable? So we'll call this the puzzle of virtual value. Now, this is just a puzzle. This is just a poser, just a thing to think about, right? This isn't yet a problem. Just like, how is it? We don't know. Um, we do imagine that uh, the realist could see some hope in here in which to, to, to launch an argument against uh, Nathan and I's uh, irrealist position. And we think the argument would go something a bit like this. I mean, 
I haven't seen a realist write it exactly in these terms, but talked around, this is the sort of thing you hear, um, and we're trying to do our best to reconstruct what the argument would end up looking like. I'll say something about it in a minute uh, for the philosophers in the room, right? Um, number one, real things can be valuable. That's just a given, right? Obviously, real things can be valuable. Secondly, imaginary things cannot be valuable. Number three, virtual objects are not real. Well, we are committed to that, right? We have to say that. We're a realist. Conclusion, virtual objects cannot be valuable. Now, when we think about arguments in philosophy, we think, first of all, are they valid and then are they sound? Now, what we mean by valid here is, again, not what ordinary language would, uh, how ordinary language would be used. What we mean by valid is, if it were the case that these three premises were true, does that absolutely guarantee that the fourth one, the conclusion, is true? Right? Does it have a structure that means, as long as they are true, four is true? Actually, it doesn't have that structure. And it importantly doesn't have that structure because we start talking about imaginary things right, and not real. So we're implying that every object is either real or imagined. Right? That's a suppressed premise in the first version that we give. So every object is either real or it's imaginary. They need to add that in to get a valid argument. So we'll act as if that premise is in the argument. So faced with this argument, from the realist against the irrealist on the basis of value, we have several strategies. Strategy one, we could abandon irrealism. No, it's no fun at all, right? Uh, challenge two, uh, P2 directly. I actually think there's an awful lot to be said uh, against P2. Imaginary things cannot be valuable. I'm pretty sure they can. Imaginary friends and various other things. Um, that's a bigger argument in a slightly different domain, and I think it's an argument can be made it's not the one we'll make today because we are definitely interested in showing how uh, the, uh, if, if you like, the law is acting as if this is true at the moment, right? I think they're wrong to do so, but hey, let them act like that. We're not going to change that. But maybe what we can change is we can get them to adopt our fictionalist view of what's virtual and then they'll have a mechanism consistent with the other things they want to keep believing, rightly or wrongly, that'll help them in cases like this in the future. That was kind of the idea. So we're going to challenge P3A, that is, we're going to challenge the idea that every object is either real or imaginary. And I want to do it through the parable of the pawn, because I like alliteration, and also because they brought up the pawn in the discussion in the, uh, in, of the legal case, and I'll get to that in a second. So here's things that pawns can do. Um, they can vanquish their opponents by moving diagonally upon them. Uh, they can move forward one square or two, uh, depending on whether it's their first shot or not. They can metamorphize into any other piece when they reach the other end of the board. It's an exciting life to be a pawn, right? So are pawns real or imaginary? Well, listen, all those things I just described to you, what pawns can do, there's nothing in the real world that can do those things. So in that sense, you want to say, no, they can't be real, right? They can't vanquish, they can't metamorphize, right? They don't have those properties, they can't be real. But also, they're clearly not imaginary. When you play standard chess, players will get eight physical figurines, each of which is a pawn. I can pick it up, I can carry it away, I can steal it, I can do various things with it. So, this is a bit puzzling. Should we consider them real or imaginary? Well, they're not real and they're not imaginary, according to what I've put here. And here we'll put up a straw man, right? We'll put up a pretend realist who, who takes the realist pawn position, and they say, look, pawns just are, remember that are, that just are physical figurines, right? So you're puzzled about what they can do. No, no, that's a pawn. See that little wooden thing? That's a pawn. But pawn realism can't be right, I say. In standard chess, each pawn is represented by one figure. That's one-to-one -one relationship. That looks like a candidate for identity, at least. But correspondence chess is where we play with two boards and two sets at a distance of mail, email, or phone calls where there are two pawns for every one in the game. There are two physical objects for every one in the game. Notice that's the cross-play problem again, the throwing the frisbee problem all over again. But it gets even weirder for the pawn because he can play blindfold chess. Some of us can. Adam, can you play blindfold chess? No, I think Daniel can. Daniel can. Okay, there are some, among, <laughs> there are some day walkers amongst us, right? <laughs> Who can do this, right? Who can hold the whole of a game of chess in their head and imagine all the moves without any pieces. Notice, for the rest of us, it's really useful to have those, those figurines, right? But not essential. So we've got a virtual pawn that isn't identical with one piece, 
when it's not standard chess. So it can't just be the case that pawns are identical with one piece. There's no one-to-one -one correspondence between the game object and the figurine, therefore they can't be identical. They're just not the right sort of relationship. So in the context of the legal discussion around the RuneScape case, there's a commentator here, Walzik, and what he says is this. He's, he's quoting the Advocate General, paraphrasing more usefully than the Advocate General said it themselves, and obviously translated out of the Dutch into English so I can quote it, which is handy. He said, as the Advocate General observed in his advisory opinion, a virtual mask is not purely imaginary, unlike the imaginary virtual board and pieces used in a game of blindfold chess. So all the way down, they've been worrying about, is this just mere bits and bytes? This is the kind of argument they're having with the prosecutor and defence, and this is the kind of reasoning aloud that you get from the Advocate General. I, I mean, is this, are these things genuinely real? And they go on some side road worrying about, like, electricity for a while. Yeah, ask me about that in question, it's, I think they're wrong. Um, but anyway, they, they're kind of really weighing up, is it, real? is it real enough to be stolen? I don't really know what to say about this. And they come to the conclusion that whatever it is, it isn't purely imaginary. There's some imagination going on, but it's not purely imaginary. And I think the importance of purely there has really got to be highlighted. From their point of view, the fact that it wasn't purely imaginary made all the difference to whether or not this counted as theft. So the parable of the pawn, as I like to think of it, is that the physical figurine is not the pawn because of correspondence and blindfold checks. The pawn is neither fully real nor fully imaginary, right? It's not fully imaginary because we've usually got some item to hold, and it's not fully real because the item doesn't have all the properties. So the dichotomy of premise 3A, that something is either real or it's imagined, well, we want to say that's just false. The pawn shows us. So we think that the argument from value against the realism fails. It fails because it needed premise 3A. It needed us to believe that things were either real or imagined. And if you buy what I've said about the pawn, you should think that that was false. Okay, so I started with the realism and realism problem, kind of that little bit of argument, and then I gave our positive picture of Waltonian fictionalism. Then th talked a little bit about the puzzle of theft, but really the puzzle of virtual value is where I wanted to go. I talked a bit about that, and I showed that the argument that could be inspired by that puzzle, the argument against the realist fails, but it doesn't solve the puzzle, right? Just saying that this one argument that comes out of this puzzle doesn't work. It doesn't say I've solved the puzzle. I haven't told you anything yet that would solve the puzzle. I've just said that that accusation doesn't hold. So the puzzle of virtual value stems from that puzzle of virtual theft. They were worried about whether or not the RuneScape case could count as theft, and they concluded that it could because there was value, but I said that just moves the problem. Yeah. The puzzle of virtual value is the puzzle of how it is that things get their value if they're not purely physical entities. And again, there's a very good line to be had here in saying, well, they don't need to have that imaginary friends and so on. But given the nature of the legal beast at the moment, that's for another day. But our diagnosis of the puzzle is that it's based on a false dichotomy between the real and the purely imaginary. And that doesn't yet solve the problem, as I just said. It just kind of rebuts the objection against it and doesn't solve it. But we do think the solution comes from this Walt Fictionalist picture. We think Walt Fictionalism is just a striking account of how a third way an object can be. It can be Walt Fictional. That's to say, there can be a physical part, the prop. There can be the imagined or fictional or virtual part, which is Pikachu, a, a virtu you know, the game, the game object of the pawn. It can be those bow and arrow and Vikings. And since fictional, fictional entities often, as in when you can't just play, you know, <coughs> a blindfold chess in your head, they get physical tokens, these props, and there's no puzzle as to how the prop can be valuable. Right? So you steal my pawn, I can't play chess properly anymore. Um, the pawn might be made of like some fancy material, and then it's got other value too. Right? But notice if you bar access to the prop, it deprives the user of the props, at least part of what makes the prop valuable. So you take that pawn away from me, I can't play chess, that was what was valuable about it to me. Not necessarily the wood it was made from or something else I wanted to do with it. The fact that it let me play this game of chess. Imagine you're a huge Harry Potter fan, um, you could, in theory, sit there and just imagine the whole story in your head. But really, you want that prop, right? You want that book, that book that inspires the imagining, that kind of helps you and aids you and guides your imagining. The kid in the RuneScape case could just close his eyes and imagine he still had 
the magical amulet and all the rest of it. But that wasn't enough, right? He needed to be able to do this interacting thing with his computer and the wider community based around the prop. And the prop here is that um, code, if you like, the kind of silicon chip digital object that allowed him to get the right imagining going, not just for him, but for others in his community. What these kids did was that they barred him access to the prop. So there's no puzzle as to how a prop can be valuable. So there's no puzzle as to how a prop can be stolen. And it's the prop that got stolen. What went with it and what he really felt like he cared about was the virtual stuff, but it was his access via the prop that created, that depriving him that access was where the harm bottomed out. We think if the legal um, reasoning had adopted this position, they would have got to the conclusion a bit more neatly. And we think it'll help guide thinking in the future about it. So we think this is a really useful tool that we just came up with, well, not came up with, we borrowed from Walt, Walton, but that we you know, wanted to apply in the context of dealing with uh, uh, Chalmers' realism. But we think it's got this additional benefit too. It'll help us think about a range of other now complicated mixed things. Now, as um, Michael said before, there are two components uh, to my LCAS, virtual reality is one, but augmented reality is the other. What we've been talking here is virtual reality. Augmented reality is going to be yet more complicated here. Virtual reality, you put on the headset, you're locked away. The real world isn't relevant effectively anymore. You look around and you do stuff over there. Augmented reality is going to leave you in the real world and it's going to bring virtual entities into the space with you. It'll put something on that table, for example. But some people like to call augmented reality mixed reality. I don't. But the reason they want to call it mixed reality is it requires some part of the actual world effectively blended with a digital thing. Right? So suppose I'm in the middle of playing a game of virtual something or other around this room that requires the chairs to be where they are and the table to be where they are. You can mess with my game by moving these things around. So augmented reality is going to have this weird kind of connection between the virtual and the real world. Moreover, if you remember the Pokemon Go stuff, People were trying to get Pokemon out of other people's gardens. This was causing problems, as you might imagine. People were having actual fights over stuff and all the rest of it. But there was like real world things that we're used to. Like, I've got this object over here, right? And it's mine or something. But if you've got some digital thing that attaches to that object, it really complicates who's got an investment in any given object, any given environment, and all the rest of it. And this is throwing up a range of puzzles about property, intellectual property rights, kind of copyright issues. Um, in relation to, to digital things, which have always been so clearly separated from the physical things, that we're now getting this blending. And we think that, well, fictionalism might be a really good tool for them to use in terms of trying to think through these legal issues in the coming years. That's why we think it's interesting. Okay, I'll summarise this argument again for clarity, and then we've got time for questions. So Chalmers thinks that virtual entities are genuinely real and genuinely valuable. We think that they're not genuinely real, but that doesn't bar them from being genuinely valuable. The puzzle that was thrown up is if they're not real, how is it they can be valuable? And we want to say, look, they're not real, they can still be valuable. And one way to think about that is to think about the props as the thing that really bears the value. Right? And if the props is what bears the value, then there's no puzzle to answer. Props are physical things, ordinary things in the world that you can be barred access from. And therefore, they can be stolen. Okay. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes, so if people have questions, the philosophers will find out. Any non philosophers? Let's start off with Cliff. So, I have a question about your characterization of data structures as props for world fiction. Because, at least, my hunch is that they're one step removed, they're props for props, as it were. So in the presentation of a story that aids in my fictional engagement with it, there are the visual representations that are there on the screen, or um, whatever mode of access I'm having to it there on the page. And I'd be inclined to see the data structures as Something more like the more like the brush, and the paint, and the canvas, along perhaps with a mechanism for putting the brush together with the paint and the canvas, rather than the painted image of 
the hero of the story, that serves as the prop for the fictional engagement. So why don't you want to say there, as it were, um, one step removed, there's, there's one more metaphysical thing in our account that we need to make sense of? Yeah, I guess it's partly because of a reductionist in the background anyway that I don't start saying things like that. And again, another kind of explanation as to why I didn't talk like that would be that Chalmers started to talk about digital structures and we're just matching what he's talking about. But actually what I think is going on there is I think you're right that kind of what we would see on the screen or what we would have represented to us on the, the screen uh, in, in a VR scenario um, is a good candidate to be considered a prop just like the, the, the oil on the canvas. I don't really think I'm saying anything that competes with that exactly. Um, I'm sort of talking... The difference I think we're talking about between how you've characterised things and when we're talking about data structures is almost like the difference between the, the kind of um, the paint on the canvas and the you know molecules and all the rest of it. It's more like a, 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 a direct um, reduction to a lower level of whatever does the constituting, right? Now it might not be as easy as constitution given the way that the stuff on the silicon chips. It has a causal gap between there and what happens on the screen. I don't really mind that. That arrow of causation is no problem from the things we were talking about, you know, the, the, the weak virtual case and all the rest of it. It still doesn't get you causation between the frames of the animation, if you like, right? It doesn't get you the across the way bit at the level it would need to be in order for you to start reifying the objects at that, at the virtual objects in the way that Chalmers used. That's exactly what he does. He just appeals to a fictionalism. Uh, sorry, not fictional, a functionalism about... Uh, about what it is to be an entity, and therefore they have causal things, they are that entity. And that's the bit that doesn't work, even if I was to start characterizing the prop as the thing that happened on the screen rather than the, the digital, the silicon chips. So I think it still works, but this is a, it, it would probably be better to talk in those terms, in the terms you've given us, if we talk to the legal scholars again, rather than carry on with the kind of charmers inspired lingo of data structures. Um. I think Martin Adam was first. Okay. Um, I just wondered what you thought about do you think the value of a virtual object depends on money? Or do you think it could like the case would have turned out differently if the like the amulet wasn't didn't cost the person any money? So they're self threatened and stuff, but say for the likes of Pokemon, you have to walk ten kilometers to hatch this egg, it's like really rare. <coughs> Thing, but, but people still want it and they don't want to extend the time. Yeah. So do you think it's purely dependent on money or do you think about the things that um, you earn through just extend short time? If I'm remembering rightly, they reasoned that bit out explicitly and they said there is a cash value, which is a shortcut to talking about the value here, but actually even if it hadn't had cash value, it would still have value because of the amount of effort they went into getting it. Exactly as you say, you mix your toil right, with the game in some sense and you come out with something that you didn't have before that's desirable, that's got value. The problem was that uh, it's even worse in the German system than it is in the, in the Dutch system. Um, for, for the Dutch, it's that you can't steal something that's intangible. Um, in the German system, it's you can't steal anything that's not physical. So it's just not called stealing at that point. There's another word for things like you know, intellectual property stuff. Uh, uh, but it's uh, intangible. And that's where they start to talk about electricity, actually. Because they say, electricity is not tangible. I was like, yeah, it is, just very, very briefly. <laughs> um, it's not an intangible, right? It's not what they really, it's not what they were getting at. They were talking about, it's not stuff you can pick up and run away with, right? Which is obviously where this all got started, uh, you know, the legal precedent stuff got started. But it, seeing them reason through it, they were exactly, as you say, not taking cash as the only arbiter of value. Thankfully, that would be a disaster. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So I wish it was close to, to blends. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, let me try to put it a different way. See, it's something as though what you need, but tell me if I'm wrong, what you need in order for the prop to give value to the thing is for the prop to be some, somehow constitutive. Right? If it's just something that causes the thing, that's not going to give it to you, right? So the fact that I have lunch now causes me to go into virtual reality later. If I didn't have lunch, I would probably just like faint in, a, in my office and not go to the virtual reality lab. Right. So you don't want to say that that's why my lunch is, that my, that my lunch is, the value of my lunch is part of the value of the virtual reality objects, even though it's part of the causal chain, right? Great. So what you need is probably something like a constitutive picture, which for the props, the, for the fictionalists, for the world of fictionalists, that's plausible, right? Mm -hmm. So it's plausible that the object is constituted by 
the fiction object is constituted by the book itself and uh, whatever I imagine. Pre pretty sure they're not going to go as strong as const constitution. Um, I'm trying to do it live. I'm pretty certain that Kendall Walton will not say that it constitutes. What I'm trying to say is that for the value claim, that's what you need. You need it to be part of the thing in order to make the thing more valuable. It, it, it shouldn't just be a causal chain because then you're going to pump my lunch and take adding value to the. So if, I, if you steal my lunch from me, you're just you're stealing my virtual reality object's value. So that doesn't seem right. Well, yeah, so you get the consequential loss and all the rest of it. So in, ter in terms of the value, we don't end up saying that Pikachu is valuable, exactly. What we say, we don't have to say that. I mean, we'll remain neutral on whether or not Pikachu is valuable. What we will absolutely say is that the prop is valuable and your access to the prop is valuable, valuable to you because it matters to you, right? So without, the, without access to the prop, that's the gatekeeper of being able to do something else. Now, that, that's equally true of, say, money, right? And my lunch. And your lunch, yeah. potentially. The, the, the reason you're using the lunch, of course, is because we normally consider that like a distal cause or we put other language in to say it's somehow not relevant, um, not you know, core relevant to what went on. But it's the sort of thing that with there's a very normal process where without this one thing, this other thing doesn't happen, you're deprived of this one thing, then you can claim consequential loss in a legal context and other contexts. Yeah, just another couple of questions, sorry, if we get these through. <laughs> I'm not a philosopher, so this may be a completely misguided question, but I, I was struck throughout your talk of similarities to discussions of signifiers and signified objects and, and how language works, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of your, well, I guess, I guess I would wonder how this relates to that, because some of the things that you're saying seem to therefore conclude that language or spoken language isn't therefore valuable. But I think many people would argue that it is and that it can be stolen. So I'm wondering how, how your ideas of props is similar or different from signifiers and what that means in terms of either this or that or something. I don't really know if I'm phrasing this well. But. I think I get the spirit of the thing. Um, I, I, I'm, don't, I'm not clear on signifiers and signified, although I can get a hint of it. But similar to what you're saying for props, well, basically. But what I didn't say, I was hope, I didn't say, is that you need a prop to be valuable. It's just when you've got a prop, you've definitely got a way out of any worry about value that you've got. I think what you're maybe getting at in the case of language is what I alluded to earlier as the P2 strategy, I think, where you say, no, imaginary things, as in things that aren't tangible, physical, or manifested in a prop or anything else, right? There's none of that, something like just an imaginary game you play by yourself or even language that we use. Um, that that, I didn't say that couldn't be valuable. In fact, I think it can, but the, the argument I gave said it can't be valuable, but I was, of course, speaking as if I was somebody else at that point. So I don't endorse the idea that that can't be valuable. I think you're right that it can be valuable. I just think that the, it wouldn't be recognized as having the relevant sort of value to be stolen according to the legal context. And if you think it can be stolen, then you've got something to say over here, which is cool. For, for the definition of props, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people would think that words are props because they prompt imagination of what that word means and they mm -hmm. have no bearing on the actual nature of that word. They don't look like the word at all uh, mm -hmm. or the object that they signify. So that's, yeah. that's kind of where it's going. Um, so I guess my question is for you, yeah, I guess the, really the question is for props. Does that require a tangible thing for you? Or could it be something that is, say, a word that is intangible but still signifies and prompts you to imagine something? Well, a prop has to be the physical thing, and I buy the, the kind of noises made out of a mouth and all the rest. That's a physical thing. That can be a prop, right? Uh, that's, I think that's totally fine um, in, in the kind of Waltonian picture. Um, that's not a requirement on being valuable, though, as I say, right? So the, it's, it's like dead easy to spot when the prop goes away that there's something valuable has gone away, and it's the kind of the easy route, if you like. There's a secondary question of whether or not like, other things are still valuable. I think they are. As I said, imagine if ends is just an easy go-to case, but... Um, uh, the, the, the blindfold chess case. Um, it's not easy to see how you steal that from someone, right? It's not see, you know, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind type cases or something. But it's not easy to see how you actually steal something that is purely imaginary. But, you know, if you can deprive somebody of the access to it, then it looks like it can be stolen. So, yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm agreeing with you. Final question, very quick. Yeah. Thank you. I like your move. Here's a devil's advocate. So, uh... Suppose someone plays a you. Suppose you play a run performance on a camera, mm -hmm. you, the minute balls or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to think that the value of your performance is going to be reducible to the value of the prop of the performance. 
that's what you just do the piano, right? Because it might be a beautiful performance, you've got your piano. Um, insofar as we think that that seems intuitive, it looks like a strange result for your solution to the puzzle because it looks like the value of your whatever type of digital entity, including maybe a digital achievement, is going to be explained exclusively in terms of the value of the prop. But we might have a similar type of situation where you have a great performance, crappy prop, and it doesn't seem like all the value of the relevant digital entity is going to be captured by reducing it to the value of the prop for the entity for reasons that are analogous to. So in a bad piano, you've got an intrinsically not terribly valuable thing, but if it's the last piano on earth, well, okay, then it gets some, some other value. My point being, um, the thing that gives the piano some value is what you can imagine with it and what you can do with it, right? So it's not just the fact that, not just the piano and its bad piano-ness, right? You can create something beautiful on it, it gains additional value by that, right? And if you want to call, the, the, the kind of appreciation of the performance might be some sort of imaginative act, um, but I don't think that that's, so I don't think, for example, that stealing somebody's virtual reality gear means you've stolen exactly the cash value of that from them. I don't think it's as simple as that. I think you've stolen from them that plus whatever they could do, right? PhD thesis on a cheap laptop. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> right? If that gets stolen, it's more than just the, the intrinsic valuable object that gets nicked, I think. On that point, let's thank Niels for a fascinating talk.